Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, good. So, and then do I have a clicker, I guess? I'm not, okay, I'm gonna do this. So, hi, thank you for staying so late. Um, I really appreciate it. I just got in from Seattle. I took the train down, a lot of fun. So, uh, the goals of this presentation are to, uh, that you'll have an understanding of how to build a system for churn prediction. And even though I use churn prediction in all these examples, um, you'll be able to do it for many things like conversion or adoption, any business process that generally has a date. Um, you should be able to apply this uh, same techniques too. Um, if you're currently building your own systems, you'll have some new avenues to explore if you haven't thought of them. And then lastly, um, some of the hard lessons that we learned as, building, as we built up this system, um, I want to share some of that uh, with you. I'll share all of it if I could, if I had time. So uh, the agenda today is we're going to talk about the problem definition, both uh, in terms of the business problem and also the implementation. Uh, talk about something called a you know, data model that I recommend. Feature engineering, uh, model development, and evaluation in particular to, biz, uh, to um, behavioral data. I, th I think many of you are experts in that, so I'll just um, try to um, introduce a term for the first time. And, and if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. But by the end of this presentation, if you're not hitting those goals, please feel free to talk to me or talk to me afterwards, and then I will make sure that you are going to get your money's worth out of this presentation. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm vice president of Manage at DocuSign. I'm responsible for search, reporting, insights, document processing, agreement intelligence, and our internal advanced analytics platform. Prior to that, I uh, had my own company. I was the founder and CEO of Apuri. We were a um, company that did churn prediction for gaming, consumer, and B2B SaaS companies. We were acquired by DocuSign in 2017. We were setting up, we were bringing them on board as a customer when they started to talk about their plans for the agreement cloud and how they want to apply um, intelligence to that. And I thought that was an amazing vision that they had. And so we joined forces there. Prior to that, I had a game company called Z2 Live. Um, some of you may or may not know it if you're in the mobile space, but it was a top 10 game company um, on iOS. Uh, we did games, Trade Nations, Battle Nations, Metal Storm Online. Uh, we were acquired by King in 2015, the people that do Candy Crush Saga. And then prior to that, I was at, at Microsoft for 14 years, where I was one of the core designers of Xbox Live. My gamer tag is the letter D on the service, which gives me street cred with my daughter's friends. So I am the cool dad uh, because I have an Xbox Live gamer tag. It was well worth 14 years at Microsoft to do that. So uh, problem definition. So oftentimes, and, and I don't know your background, so I'm going to assume that many of you are professionals in the field, but um, in this particular case, I'm going to talk about a, a domain where you're taking lots of business data from different systems, you're taking application data, you're taking telemetry data, and I'll, I'll define these in a moment, and you're bringing them together for the purpose of a business outcome. It might be analyzing campaign data um, in terms of effectiveness, or it might be um, looking for opportunities for upsell, cross-sell, et cetera. You're using machine learning to do this, um, and we'll talk about, uh, about the process of machine learning, especially with behavioral data, but um, throughout there, we're, we're gonna be talking about drivers as well, and that is being able to extract not only a score, or kind of a confidence or likelihood, but also um, from, the, from the model itself, um, talking about um, why, does that, why does the machine think that score is what it is? And then, um, that lastly, you know, I'll talk a little bit about the actual data platform that, that we recommend building or the types of things you have to build to support you. I, can't, I, I can give a whole presentation on the, on the platform in itself, but I can't do it justice here to talk about uh, everything. So by all means, I'd love to follow up with anybody that's interested about any questions you have on any of the stuff. Um, I love talking about it. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, churn prediction in particular, and most people would think of churn prediction as, a, as stop loss intervention. So you're going, you see a, a customer account, you're looking forward some time period that we call prediction lead, so let's say 30 days before the uh, renewal period, and you want to see, okay, is this account likely to renew its subscription or not? And if it's not going to renew its subscription, what are the drivers of why, what might be reasons for that? So that's a stop loss, right? And then you, given the drivers from the model, you can then go and apply those to some intervention programs. It might be potentially discounting it. It might be education about how they can use the product better. And, and as we'll talk about, uh, we go to build the model, the longer period you have before they churn, the better you have to maybe save that, that customer. 
But this is also um, very good for win-back forensics. So of the people that have left, there might be a portion that um, were using your product in a way that if they were just educated about a new feature or maybe a discount, they may come back. So it's called win-back um, from um, kind of analysis. There are other things that are also important that come out of a model and come out of a system like this, such as the drivers of churn. So um, oftentimes we found as a company that when we tell our customer, okay, account ABC has an 80% likelihood to churn, you know, the, the account rep might say, no, nah, I just talked to them the other day. I, you know, I don't think so. I think they're solid. And it wasn't good enough to just have a number that came from the model. What we had to do is we had to, to look at, we used a, a logistic regression model, and we looked at all of the features that were feeding into that particular account score, and then we can surface those features in the form of drivers to say, okay, not only does the machine think that this uh, ABC Corp has an 80% chance of, of churn, but what's coming up are these particular factors from the model, and that really helped um, uh, engage with the customer because you knew why the model was giving you those scores. And then one thing that came out of it in terms of being out in the field and selling this was um, corporate revenue predictions. So if you can give every account kind of a green, yellow, red score, and then you can kind of apply that to the, the actual revenue from that account, it gives you this blended um, projection of your revenue. So this is very important for corporate uh, you know, earnings predictions. So they can say, you know, let's say 25% you know, of our revenue is in the red category, so we're going to multiply that by you know, some factor, let's say 50% because we think 50% of those accounts are going to churn, and then 25% is in yellow, maybe we'll multiply it by 75%, and then we have green, we'll multiply it by 90%. We'll get this blended average of our quarterly revenue based upon not some sales rep's uh, opinion or account manager's opinion of what that account is doing, but actual from the data. And, that was, and there's other things that uh, came out of just selling churn prediction in the field. Um, for example, um, finding an ideal customer segment. So if you're looking at all of your customers that are in the green, that they're, they're likely to renew, you, know, you can start looking at those different segments saying, hey, that's a great customer base for us. Um, I remember one of our customers, uh, when we ran churn prediction on their, on their portfolio of, of, of SMB, they noticed that people in manufacturing were much more likely to stay with them. And then that insight didn't come out of their own product analytics or marketing segmentation. It came out of the churn prediction, naturally, because when they went, okay, let me look at this uh, predictive score by industry, uh, manufacturing uh, came out, and then they, they focused their whole sales um, kind of efforts toward that by changing the incentives of the sales structure. So by immediately, they could make use of this type of thing. And I'm not selling a product, I'm just telling you what we did. And hopefully, as you go to sell data science and machine learning in your own organizations, you can maybe uh, start thinking about those scenarios and those outcomes. Um, also, you know, true, mar true marketing campaign efficiency. So oftentimes, marketing campaigns will, will look for how many people came through the funnel and signed up, but they don't look, once they've um, activated, if they actually stuck around to being good customers. So what you want, obviously, is not only customers to sign up and activate, but you want them to stay with you, and you want them to renew, and you want them to be successful. And oftentimes, marketing doesn't look at that data. They look at the top of funnel, whereas as a business, you kind of have to look at the full funnel, uh, all the way up to customer success. So, um, you know, data science, and, and I'm, I'm obviously singing to the choir here, but, but successful data science projects are hard work. Oftentimes it takes months, potentially years, to, um, to kind of to, to assemble all of the pieces that you, you need. And this light's kind of bright, so I can't see if people are nodding or not, but I'm assuming people have had this experience where they have to go and talk to, let's say, you go talk to a business group, and then you have to learn the domain of... The, uh, the problem domain, okay, so it's a uh, marketing campaign analytics, okay, and then you have to go and say, okay, what data do we have access to, okay, you got to go assemble the data sources, and so it's a data discovery process, and so on and so forth, and so you go, okay, now we got to bring it into a place, we got to ETL it or load it into a, maybe a data warehouse to operate on, we have to do some wrangling, um, and it's funny because when you talk to most data scientists, they'll tell you, oh yeah, you know, 80% of the time is spent data wrangling. Well, data wrangling is, is a whole team had to do a lot of work just to get data into a form where you can bring it onto your laptop and wrangle it. You know, there's, there's all sorts of warehousing and other stuff. And then once you're done with the actual data science project and you have, let's say, predictive scores and you have an algorithm, some teams had to go deploy that into production and get that running, you know, kind of nightly or monthly or however often you want to run the project. So there's a lot of work here involved. And as we were trying to sell uh, churn prediction in terms of uh, to companies, um, it was very difficult to kind of you know, kind of onboard them into this, 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 this large, um, these large projects just to get to results. 
So one of the lessons learned for us was to create a, what I call a, um, you know, an, a, a standard advanced analytics data model for specific to your business. So what this is, and I'll kind of skip forward to it, so a data model for your business is, and I'm, I'm just going to use a B2B SaaS model here for, for example. Some of it applies to some of you, some of you might be in consumer or gaming. It doesn't matter. Just as, as long as you have a model that represents your business, it's, and I call it advanced analytics data model because it's not just a copy from the BI system of your different source, different, different uh, systems of record or business, you know, uh, business systems. So for example, if Salesforce has 50 tables, the BI system will typically bring in 50 different tables and through some process nightly, and then the data warehouse will have 50 different tables. What I'm talking about is a transformation that happens on top of that data into domains where you can now do analytics on them. So for example, let's say in Salesforce there's a flag on the account table that, that is necessary for segmentation. And then in your application database, there's some, uh, another um, field that is important for the account. In BI systems, they might bring those in as different tables and then somewhere, someplace, someone's got to join those. What you want to do in your advanced analytics data model is to actually create an account object that has all of those fields pulled from the different systems onto the account object. If you have a subscription business, for example, you want to have a subscription object that represents the kind of the start of the subscription and the end of the subscription if they've canceled and um, all of the other data that you need for establishing ground truth, uh, maybe upsell as well. Um, for users, oftentimes users are attached to an account, but you want to be able to associate that user, and especially the behavioral data, which I'll talk about in a minute, to the subscription that, they're, um, that they are kind of uh, charged against and to the account. And then things, for example, like other systems, NPS scores, um, ticket systems, you know, Zendesk kind of stuff, you want to bring that in as well. And you don't want to leave it in the, uh, in the existing form. You want to bring it into a form that's very easy for um, analytics. And so the ideal, I think, for a company is to, uh, especially if you're, uh, if you're responsible for the data platform, is to bring in what I call an armature or kind of a, a scaffold structure for a data model that everyone can use. And that's the core data model. We'll have things like accounts and subscriptions and users to it. And then as, as different uh, constituents inside of the company use this model, they can bring in their own data and then apply that to this. So for example, if marketing wants to understand marketing campaigns, they can start with your core data model that you run as a center of excellence for the uh, advanced analytics platform, but then the marketing team and their data scientists can attach their own model to that. And if they want to push down some of those fields into the, um, the core model that everyone uses, that's fine. Then you kind of can take ownership of that from a data governance point of view from the advanced analytics platform, but you can let people have their own sort of their own uh, um, augmentation to that data in an ideal world. Is there any questions before I, I move on? I see some people nodding, so I just want to say, does this make sense to build your own model that's specific for analytics? So yes, very, very much so. So, um, and this allows you to do things that are quite neat. So for example, um, do open tickets affect likelihood to recommend, right? So these are things that get asked of you and you go, well, um, you know, ticket server in Zendesk, likelihood to recommend is a, or, you know, maybe a CSAT or something like that. That's in another database. It might be a pulse survey. And so you can go, well, now if I've joined them together to the account, now I can start making that kind of analysis for the business team. Or, um, who are our most engaged users? Maybe what kind of roles do they have? Is this admins or is this um, you know, secretaries or is this uh, you know, uh, people that are doing reports? Who's using the product, for example? So you can kind of look at, okay, given our users, when they're attached to the usage data, you know, now I can kind of quickly understand who might we be, who might we be targeting best for, um, let's say, upsell, or what, what kind of features are sticky for that particular users. Um, the thing that we'll talk about in a moment is what is the likelihood that a subscription will renew? And what's interesting about that is that the, the cancellation date or the renewal date might be on the subscription object, but you want to pull in and be able to access different things. For example, does likelihood to recommend, LTR, affect um, the uh, renewal? And now, now that you have a canonical data model, you can start making those uh, inferences and start doing that analytics. And a whole bunch of, you know, and, and anything else. And it's often because if you build the platform right, you will have data sources in there that nobody else has. In particular, attaching your telemetry data, the behavioral data, to this um, kind of to these uh, to these entities, 
very few companies that we had worked with uh, as an independent company had that capability. And so by doing that, you'll find that the, um, you'll be able to get to success and be able to answer questions that can't be asked anywhere else in the different systems. So lastly, before I move on into the um, kind of the model and feature, uh, feature engineering portion, I'm going to talk a little bit about the usage data. So when I say usage data or behavioral data or telemetry data, what I'm talking about is the, um, this messy, you know, missing, semi-structured time series event data it typically comes in from things like mixed panel or heap or, or amplitude. Um, formats generally line delimited JSON. It's, it's semi-structured, and it generally is in the form of a timestamp, an event name, and then a body of key value pairs that are very specific to that particular event. So a login event might have certain things. When you hit, the, let's say, the marketing page, it might have, um, let's say, um, kind of redirect information for marketing campaigns. As you're using the product uh, heavily, it might have very specific thing to your, your particular product. Uh, at DocuSign, you can imagine when I, you know, I upload a document to apply to send for signing, there might be some information, non-PII data, nothing, nothing sensitive, but there might be some usage data that comes along with that. So a critical piece here is the fact that when you bring in this usage data um, for analytics, you want to be able to associate it not, with the, not only with the user, which it generally comes in at. So the user logs in and they have some sort of token, and that token's being sent with every one of their events. But in your advanced analytics platform, you want to be able then to assign that to which subscription they're on and which account they belong to while they were using that. And this can, sometimes it might be easy. So if, if, if you don't have the notion of different subscriptions for a user or different products for a user, it's all one thing. It could be a very simple one-to-one -one mapping. Or if you have, okay, you have different plans and this user is an admin and they're on a different plan, you know, you have to determine that. But the key here is that in your advanced analytics platform, to do that association, because going forward when you do analytics, you want to be able to attribute user behavior data to the target that you are looking at. Okay, for example, uh, what feature is very sticky for this particular user? Well, you would need to be able to go and, and assign, okay, not, you know, let's look at the, the, the user, and then let's go maybe grab SKU information off of the subscription information to figure out what SKU are they on, and then go and use that to determine, um, let's say, an upsell opportunity. So lessons learned here from this particular uh, facet was that typical BI systems bring in um, the, kind of your Salesforce data, Zora data, maybe application, um, or maybe even um, aggregate activity. So you know, counts of usage by day, counts of login by day, that kind of thing. These systems, BI systems, typically do descriptive analytics uh, that are always a lagging indicator of business activity. So obviously we look at revenue as a, as a big number in, 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 in business, you know, um, BI systems. Revenue is the laggiest of all indicators because revenue for that quarter was, was comprised of activities that may have spanned multiple years. It could have been multiple years of, of developing that relationship with that customer or engagement with that particular large account, and that shows up on this quarter's revenue. They're always lagging in terms of the BI systems. Um, they, they're never in, because of the way you set up a, a BI data warehouse, it's never in a position to do diagnostic, predictive, or prescriptive analytics. So the, uh, the recommendation that I'd rec you know, that, that's part of my lessons learned here is build an advanced analytics platform that works in conjunction with the BI system for political reasons, obviously, and for data sharing reasons, but focus on the behavioral data first in your platform and then use that entity data for segmentation purposes. Any questions? Okay, I'm flying through this. So let's talk about feature engineering, obviously something that, that many of you do um, kind of on a, probably on a daily basis, much more than, than I would do, say. So oftentimes when we think about feature uh, engineering, uh, especially in the, in the domains of, of business, we think of it as kind of properties of the account or properties of the user. Um, typically these are things like size of business or how long they've been a customer. Um, the thing that I, the issue I have with these types of, of features is that they tend to be very predictive. So if you looked at your kind of a customer database and you said, okay, I'm going to um, kind of uh, create a score based upon size of the company, so the bigger the better, um, how long they've been with us, um, and I just come up with a score, it will probably be very correlated to churn. In other words, the enterprise customer is going to stay longer than SMB or small, medium-sized business. 
um, that's, that is correlative and predictive in a way, but it's not necessarily actionable. You can't call it through, you know, the customer and say, hey, have you thought of being bigger? You know, it'd be really bad, good for you know, increasing um, our, our numbers here this quarter. So, there, so what we want to do is focus on, oh, and another thing about these static things is that um, once you start changing behavior of the customer, let's say that you have an engagement uh, campaign or an adoption campaign that's working really well from the customer, it doesn't change any of those static variables. It only changes their behavior, maybe some of the, um, the telemetry or the, the, um, the aggregates in terms of activity, but it's not going to change the size of the company or how long they've been a customer, et cetera. So this is a very poor, in my opinion, it's kind of a poor, you know, a poor um, predictor because it is correct. It does, it does make sense, but it's not really actionable. So what I want to focus today on and uh, talk a little bit more about is the notion of using behavioral analytics for this. So... Um, when we look at time series raw event data, think of it in terms of a customer journey as they go through your product. So um, let's say one event is, is the login event. And the login event, if you see login events, that might indicate, and assuming customers are actually doing it, not some automated process, so that might give you some rough idea of activity, okay, level of activity for the account. But then you see, and, and I'm using this from DocuSign's example, an upload document. Okay, so therefore they're doing something that's engaging in the value proposition of the product. And, and if you think real deeply about it, um, in an application from video games is that, you know, um, I have this value loop in any product that I come to regularly, whether it's Facebook or DocuSign or anything else, and the reason why I come back to that is I want to send and sign a document at DocuSign or I, I want to go check my friend's status in Facebook and whatever's keeping me coming back. If you were to think about that from the point of view of how we think about video games, there's a compulsion element to that, that loop of why we come back again and again for value. If you can capture the analytics around that compulsion loop of whatever business you're in or whatever product you, you create, then that will give you a very good idea about the true engagement and the value customers are getting, even if it's a free product or if it's a social product. So, and then you might look at some events like a, apply a template in our case is, hey, that might be an upsell opportunity. Or that's, that's an event that happens when people are really getting a lot of value out of the product and boy, we'd sure love to sell them the next SKU size up uh, when they're doing that activity. So at a very simple level, these types of events can uh, tell you a lot about it. not just the general activity, not just engagement, but opportunity as well. Now, I'm told that data scientists are sometimes uh, um, introverted, so I wanted to give you a warning. This is an interactive portion of the uh, presentation, okay? So, um, let's say that we took the activity data for companies here. Um, there's four different companies of different sizes, and we've normalized them so that, um, this, and this is an issue uh, with, with things. So if you just look at counts of transactions, and I don't care what it is, it could be logins or um, purchases on eBay, whatever it is. If you just look at, at counts or aggregates, the issue is, is that larger companies look like they're more engaged than smaller companies. And so what you want to do is you want to normalize it so that every business has the same level of activity by kind of dividing out, and you can use different factors, but by kind of dividing it out so kind of on the, on the left you can kind of see numbers there, and it's hard to see if you can't really squint to see them, but you can kind of tell that there's different, the scale of the businesses are different, but when you normalize for activity, you can kind of get a sense, an apples to apples comparison of their activity level. Okay, and then the green thing, and it's hard to tell, but the very right hand side of that, that graph is green, and the, uh, that red line represents sort of a mean over a window back. Okay, so here's the interactive portion. So, by a show of hands, how many people think that this very top company is at risk given that activity profile? So if you think they're at risk, how many people? Okay, so I see a few hands up and people. How many think that's safe? Okay, nobody thinks it's safe. Okay, but nobody thinks it's safe. Okay, so um, it's just a control there. Okay, so, um, so a few people think this company is at risk. So let's see the reveal here. Okay, so um, this customer, if you look at it sort of longitudinally and you take now a distribution of the values in that normalized, um, that normalized activity graph, and now you kind of plot this, you realize that, that this thing, they, although they have peaks, obviously, they have valleys, but this is actually not a weird state for that company to be in. So thank you for participating. I don't want to call you out if you're wrong, but that company's not at risk, okay? And it, and it turned out to be not at risk. Okay, so how about the next one, okay? So the next one, this one looks a little dangerous. I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, scared about that one. So this one is kind of taking a nosedive, and it's doesn't, it doesn't look like it's active. How many people think that one's at risk? Okay, good. Okay, you guys are good at this. Okay, I tell you. Okay, how many people don't? I think that's a, I do it. 
Okay. Well, that company is a high risk, obviously, because even though they have like a bimodal distribution over their history, they're definitely on the, on the downside of that one. Okay, this one up here, it looks like it's on the up and up, but who knows, that looks a little scary. How many people think it's uh, at risk? Nobody. How many people is safe? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so let's see here. Not, it's, it's not only safe, but it's actually trending beyond its historical, its just kind of historical um, distribution. So that one might be a potential upsell opportunity because they're, they're actually engaging it more. So maybe look into that company to see if there's parts of the product that they're using or that, that are new. And then last one, this is a, a toss-up here. So this one has like some activity and then a drop, and it looks like it's coming back. Okay, how many people think this one's at risk? Okay, see, so good, good, show hands. And then how many people think this is safe? I think it's going to be 50-50 there in my informal study. Okay, let's see what it is. Okay, so this one is interesting because this customer has a bimodal distribution of that. So oftentimes it might be a seasonal business, maybe like a tax prep business, where sometimes they're really peaky and then sometimes they drop. So in this particular case, from the activity data, we're saying, hey, that's actually kind of between their two kind of humps of, of activity. Okay, so... Thank you very much. That is the end of the activity, uh, interactive portion of the presentation. You can now re resume to normal listening. I didn't know how that joke would go over, but thanks. Okay, so, so where are we at? So, um, given to, so after we grab all of the features uh, from the model, and I kind of try to give you a textual version of this over here, of what, what gets kicked out in our processes, but the, we go through, and this is something you can do as well, I'm just, just trying to explain what, what our process is, is that when we go through and look at all of those fields on the different entities, and then we roll up all of that activity and apply it towards the uh, ground truth, and we'll talk about that in a moment, the, let's say for a churn prediction, it could be upsell or conversion date, whatever you have, um, we start getting this, these different um, facets here. So, for example, a way to read this, and this is kind of, I'll do like a, a layman's version of this, because I'm sure you guys have much more advanced techniques, but let's say that the, these are pairs, for example, for a particular feature. And the blue might represent one outcome. Let's say they churned, and the green might represent another outcome. Okay, they, they um, renewed. So this feature on the far upper left is, uh, looks like there's not a, you know, from eyeballing it, looks like there's probably not a, di a lot of difference in the distribution between these two, um, these two uh, um, categories. But this one does look like it. So even though there's a lot of people over here, you know, uh, down here on the ball, I lost my mouse, but anyhow, even the, in the second example, there's definitely a difference in the distribution for that particular feature. So there's probably some signal in there somewhere, and so on. So if you go through all of the features, some of them, for example, and I'm just going to point to the screen in this case, so um, there might be things that the users, now users obviously get aggregated up to, let's say, a subscription or an account, and then that aggregation rolls up potentially into the, the score that you're trying to uh, predict against. So it might be the case where there's a SQL aggregation going on. Um, at the top, we might have... Um, dummy variables where we have categories. So it might be SKUs, and sk there's, you know, there's four different types of SKU, and so therefore I'm gonna create a variable from zero to, or one where this particular SKU has one and everything, all the, all the other SKUs have zero, so I'm taking a category and turning it into a, a zero or one value, a dummy, var dummy variable, or it might be some combination of the two. So it might be actual just direct new, um, numbers getting plugged in from let's say MRR, a monthly recurring revenue, gets plugged in directly uh, into the model. So these are what I call candidate, uh, you know, these are candidate features. Um, so a candidate feature says, okay, yeah, there's, likely, there's likely some signal there, so you should take a look at that. How am I doing on time? I, I thought I had 45 minutes, but it sounds like I have 30. Anybody? 30, okay, sorry, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hurry. So uh, let's take a look at, at model development. So now that you have that matrix, how many of you guys have built a predictive model before using a matrix and then you have some column, which is the, the uh, predictive column? So I see a bunch of hands, and I'll go over it a little bit for people that haven't done this before, because it's going to be a little, a little gotcha here. So basically you're creating this feature matrix, um, these are all those variables we talked about, and then you have the, what is known as ground truth, and many data scientists will think of it as like, okay, there's a zero or one, so let's say we're predicting churn, so therefore it's a one if they churned and a zero if they renewed. Um, and then I'm going to run through a whole kind of turn a crank here to go figure out um, kind of uh, what the uh, predicted, uh, um, which features are predictive. So um, there's actually, there's a few techniques you can do here that I'll throw out that, that we did. And that is that, let's say that you had a column that was 100% predictive. So somewhere in Salesforce, when the, when the data came in and it got stuck onto the account column, it's, if, that, if that field exists, they, they, uh, they churned. 
right? And if the field doesn't exist, then they, then they, um, they stayed. And boy, it's 100% predictive. Well, the issue with that is called target leakage. And that means that somebody somewhere is doing a, an out, kind of an out-of-band process, which is, is leaking the target, meaning um, the customer called Jan in accounting, and they said, we're going to cancel. So then she goes over to Salesforce, and then she does something like this, marks a flag. Um, she sets, the, she, she sets the, um, the account manager to, to null. She blanks out the account manager. And then all of a sudden, the data scientist picks this up as a signal. But what really happened is this was ex post facto. They had, already, they had already canceled, and it was only in the data that was reflective of that cancellation called target leakage. So by iterating through this process, you can kind of find variables that are too good to be true. Also, you might have variables that don't have enough data. That's a common uh, pr problem for us is that, you know, with, especially with something like churn, let's say, very, let's say you have only 1% churn. So you don't, sometimes you just don't have enough data to really say that there's enough signal in that, sig you know, in that data. So it could be the case where 100% of the companies that had, you know, skew equals red churned, except that there's only 1% of them. So I, I really don't have a good model to do that. So this iterative process, and I'm sure this is kind of um, those versed in the art can figure this one out. In particular, the thing that's challenging, though, is the, the notion that ground truth in the data aspect is actually a date. It's not a one or zero. So for example, it's a cancellation date, and that's your, your ground truth of if they canceled or not. Now, the challenge is, is that you have to take the behavioral data that happened before that customer churns. So let's say ABC Corp churned last year, so you, what you want to do is, for ABC Corp and only ABC Corp, on the date that they churned last year, you want to roll back in time, let's say a year before they churned, and you want to capture all of that data up until the point that they churned, and then use that as part of the feature set that's going into the model. Well, DEF Corp churned last month. So for that company, you want to go a year from last month and do the same type of feature extraction. And so if you can imagine what you're doing, and I try to represent it in these lines, like A, B, and C here, they all churned, but they churned at different dates. And so what I need to do is I kind of have to line up that, that end date to some, let's say, T equals zero, right, the date that they churned. And then I want to go back in time for each one of those customers specific to that, uh, their data and say, let's say 30 days. And I say, okay, well, I'm going to do feature extraction up until 30 days before they left for that particular customer. And we call that, that the extraction period. And the difference between how long I go back is what I call prediction lead. Because what I'm doing, in essence, is I'm building a model for today's customers that are currently active to say, um, if they look like A did 30 days before A left, then I want to know that. And I want to know exactly which features, uh, which, which, which attributes of their product usage or their, their account data is, is predictive of that company um, leaving. Is this clear? It's a very, uh, it's a very nuanced um, concept. But I'll say, I see thumbs up over there, but I think you know what you're doing about that. I think, I think, I'm, I think, I think you could give this talk, probably, because <laughs> you know you're nodding along. So um, that's really challenging. So I'll just say this in the, in the time that I've left, that the requirement to extract this point-in-time data per customer requires this notion of an advanced analytics platform. And typically, BI systems have snapshots. So they have May or June, July, et cetera, and snapshots and aggregates. But you can't go back per customer because they don't have that fine granularity. And so the telemetry data is actually kind of easy because it's time stamped, but it's the entity data that's challenging. So I'd recommend something like a slowly changing dimension table where for each um, column in the, in the database, you're actually keeping track of changes so that you can go back in time. You can go for ABC Corp last year at this time, what was their NPS score? And you know exactly at that time um, for, for ABC Corp what it was. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip over this, unfortunately, um, because I, I thought I had 45 minutes. Um, so long story short, model evaluation typically comes in the notion of a confusion matrix. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. This is um, kind of, um, many people know this. Fundamentally, you know, you can use different algorithms for churn prediction or anything. You can run it through, a, you know, a Datadog or one of these kind of, I don't know if that's right, run, um, data robot. You can run it through these different systems or run different algorithms against it. And you can say, okay, neural nets are more accurate than logistic regression. To be honest with you, at the end of the day, it's really the signal, amount of signal in the data itself is going to give you a model. I prefer myself, I'm using something that's interpretable so that that way you can understand what variables are leading into the, um, into the results myself, even at the cost of a couple percentage points of accuracy. Um, and then 
at the end of the day, you're going to get something that looks like this, and this is kind of a funny data, but basically if I, if I took and I drug a slider up to red and I said, okay, point eight is going to be where I'm going to call someone churned, I'm going to get some results, right? Okay, you can obviously see there's lots of red dots there, meaning the people that left, but there's also some uh, like green dots or black dots. Those black dots are people that stay, so that's okay, it's a false, um, you know, like a false positive. I put them to say they're going to churn, but they actually stayed. Likewise, I can kind of drag the slider down and say, okay, well, these people are safe. And you can tell that there's some people that actually left in that safe data, um, kind of a, a false positive there. So the thing to note about this is that the red dot, when you look next to a green dot, they look exactly the same from the point of view of your data. From, from, from the signal that you captured, they look the same. So there's no way to draw a line through this where it's everyone's on one side. Everyone that left is over here, and I have 100% accuracy, and everyone that stayed is over here. That just never happens in real systems. At very best, you can keep on collecting data to separate out, and the better the model, and the better the signal in the data, you can separate it out. So um, at the end of the day, you're gonna come up with a whole bunch of parameters for model deployment, and then um, go for summary here. So this stuff is really fun. I think it's awesome stuff to do the work that, that we all get to do. Very technically challenging, both from a data engineering aspect and from the, obviously, the mathematical aspect. Um, obviously, the goals are, are, are self-evident. But um, I would say that, that you achieve these by connecting your behavioral data to your business outcome data in the way that I showed there as, as best as I could show it in the time that I had. And um, enabling this cult, you know, like a culture of collaborative data-driven um, kind of insights and taking action on that. So I want to say thank you very much for staying late and uh, hearing the speech. Thanks.